Good morning. Welcome, Antioch Bible, 11 o'clock service. Those of you here in person, God love you, God bless you. Those of you who are watching uh, on stream, tuning in, God bless you as well. I want to give you a couple of reminders, and then we're going to get moving forward. Visitors packets. If you're here in person, you can pick them up over off uh, the table. They'll be there by the end of the service. If you're uh, watching via the stream and you'd like to know more about our church with the visitors packets, all you have to do is either go online and you can hit, I'd like the information, or you can call the church and ask for Jan and she can give you the information. So that's number one. Number two, prayers, prayer requests. We've said it before. Typically when we're not in the mask with the distancing, we fill those out, we put them in the offering baskets when they're going, boy, we haven't been doing that. But we have still more than willing, if you've either got praises to update us on things that are going on, prayer requests with things you're concerned about, let us know if you'd like us to join you in prayer. So you can do it either way. You can, you can uh, send them in, write them in, call them in. Uh, or maybe the day will come back uh, sooner than later when we can put them back in an offering bag. That'd be a great day. But until then, we still have a privilege of being able to meet, being able to worship. Uh, Nicole is going to lead us again. She points us up. I believe that. As she's pointing us up, uh, I think we've got an opportunity to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you do. You've done so much. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each person that's here. Thank you for each person who's uh, watching online. And Father, even for the people, maybe he's going to pick up uh, Pastor Herb or the service a month from now. We don't know. Would you please go before Spirit of God and use the time that we have today is a time that would bring glory, honor, praise, and credit to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy New Year. Praise the Lord. And Happy New Year online. Bless you this morning. You know that we're still in this process of just kind of like inter doing intercession, basically, um, during worship. So take the time as I try to sing softly to you and just um, lift up those praises to the Lord, to the heavens, believing that he's hearing us this morning. Amen? Amen. So, Lord, we thank you today. And, Lord, we come together wholeheartedly in worship to bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, yes Lord. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Thank you, Jesus. 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship your holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore We worship your holy name. We sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. We bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. We worship your holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, we worship your holy name, we worship your holy name, oh yes we do, we worship your holy name. You're holy, you're holy, 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 your holy name. Oh, we worship you. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. We bless you, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In this next song, we're reminded that the Lord is our everything. He's all that we need this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You're everything that we need. Hear our prayers this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Lift everything up to you today, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you. Yes. Taking my sin, my cross, and my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. And we say, Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. And worthy is your name. Oh, yes, Lord. Jesus, you are the one and only Lamb of God. 
and worthy is your name. Oh, Jesus, you are the Lamb of God and worthy. that I see you are my all and all yes God hallelujah seek you as a precious jewel Lord to give up we'd be a fool you are our all and all oh yes you are for the world today. Yes, Lord. Oh, use us, Jesus. Use us, Lord. Use us, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, we seek after you. We long for you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we lean into you today, Lord. Yes, Jesus. We thirst for you. Thank you, Jesus. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You Desire and I long to worship thee. to worship you. We long to worship you. We long, we long, we long to worship you. Yes, Jesus. Oh, we're nothing without you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to
worship to you today, Lord. We come only for one reason, and that's to worship you, Jesus. Oh, we bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. You're the only one that's able to help us. So we come before you today, Lord, lifting up the prayers. Hear us, oh God. Hear us, oh God. We long to worship, to worship you alone, you alone. Oh, it's all about you, Jesus, 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 hallelujah. Good morning, Antioch. As always, we've got lots of great things ahead, events to join in on, as well as opportunities to serve. We will be celebrating the Lord's Table this morning, so for those of you at home on live stream, please take a moment to gather your elements and join us. Ladies, we would love to hear testimonies of how you saw the Lord use the Christmas outreach boxes last month. Please share your stories by emailing Michelle M. Nicholson at abchurch.org. Please note that our Sunday school teachers are on their holiday break today, but they're looking forward to seeing you all next Sunday morning, so be sure to make your reservations this week. Mops will be kicking off this Wednesday, so if you're a mother with children infant to 11 years old, we'd love for you to join us. You can register and get more information at our website, abchurch.org mops. The follow-up Champions class will be starting soon, so if you're interested in being part of the team to support new believers giving their lives to Christ, please contact Jan at the office, jhoward at abchurch.org. We will be emailing year-end giving statements by the end of the month, so if you need to update your email address with us or would prefer to receive a hard copy in the mail, please email me, mwilliams at abchurch.org. Just a reminder, the first Sunday of the month is Benevolence Sunday. 100% of your gifts to the Benevolence Fund goes to help families in need in our church and local community. Antioch, have a great week. I'm planning on uh, beginning that class on the follow-up, those four or five lessons in January. I know a number of people have signed up for it. There's still room if you would like to be a part of that. Um, doors open. The more the merrier. Um, we're going we're gonna to take the offering, but I wanted to share something quickly first, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. But as a deer panteth for the water, that song, when Nicole started singing that, I'll tell you where that took me. The guy that wrote that and his wife... I know it was March, it was in the 80s, it was Ellensburg at Central, uh, the university, but I heard them do that live. I was there for a conference with about 1,500 high school kids, and they did that song, and one of them was dying. I, I don't remember if it was the husband or the wife, but as he wrote, the, I think the husband wrote it, Nancy might know, but the wife, they were writing it, but she was dying. And I just that, whenever I hear that song, I can still remember someone writing a song while your spouse is dying. And uh, that, that one grabs me when I hear that one. And Nicole had no way of knowing that, but as I listened to that, man, it put me right back in Ellensburg, way back in the 80s. That one was, uh, was meaningful as he was singing that, the guy that wrote it. Uh, tithes and offerings, pretty simple here. Three or four ways of being able to give in person, in boxes, I also remind you this Benevolence Sunday, I think that was said. Uh, if you want to do something with benevolence, be sure and put it in an envelope. Otherwise, you can give for normal giving online. Uh, you can, you can uh, I've just lost my words, guys, and I'm sorry. We've got the app. That's the word I wanted. We can go online with the web. You can go to the app or you can go here. Uh, our prayer, again, is if you're new. Anybody here for your first time? You came with a friend? Maybe somebody knew with the live streaming. If you are, we'll just uh, say it again. Our giving here, uh, we don't ask people that are guests to give. Guests are that. They're guests. We're just glad you're here. And uh, praying that if you don't have a church that stands on the book, this may, be, may become home. But for those of you where this is your church and this is home, uh, we would ask you and encourage you. You pray to God about what he wants you to do about your giving, and then you do exactly what he tells you. And our responsibility will be to use it to try and make sure Jesus Christ is lifted high. Father, would you please take every dime that's given 
and use it in a way that the Lord Jesus Christ is magnified and glorified and people who are lost will end up finding out what it means. I was once blind, but now I see. We praise you, O God, through Jesus Christ. Amen. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand have made, I see the stars, I hear the roar thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, and when I feel that God Son, not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled. to take away my sin. Thank you, Jesus. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my Jesus. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Man, that's good stuff. I said before, Nicole, you point us up, then we can pray up. It's time for communion. Uh, I would like to remind you of a couple of things uh, regarding communion. Two different thoughts. I think they tie together. Uh, on the night that Christ was betrayed, um, he had a a Passover supper to keep with his disciples first. And part of that, uh, he had planned to remind them that there was going to be a death. He told them that before, but he's reminding them that. There's going to be a resurrection. He had reminded them that again. And that there would be a return. It's not a new message, but he knew. He knew after this, it wasn't going to be just a little bit later that night. He'd be taken off. There'd be a lot of people that would be Struggling, who had been following him for three and a half years. I'm going to read this to you. And I told the group, uh, first hour, if you're wondering where, where's, you know, we've got it in, in, in three of the different Gospels, you know, the, uh, the whole thing about communion. But 2626, that's how you remember this. Go to Matthew's Gospel, it's chapter 26, and it starts at 26. So if you're looking for easy ways to remember, where's the communion passage? 2626, I'll read while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 26, 27, 28, death, right? Took a perfect sacrifice. Remember the John 1, 29? The Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. Jesus came to die. We've talked about that. To pay for a penalty we couldn't pay. And the bread is a reminder that, that he died. And for what? He says the shedding of the blood was going to be a new covenant in his blood meant that he could purchase back and pay a penalty for us we couldn't pay ourselves. It's why communion is one of two ordinances that we remember, right? We're, we're still continuing with baptism and communion are two that were to continue in remembrance of him. But the message didn't stop with I'm going to die. And my, through my uh, shedding blood, I'm going to purchase salvation for many. He doesn't say all. Universalism is not true. People that say, because God is love, one day he'll say, oh, who cares about the rules and all that? Just everybody's in. He says the shedding of the blood was new covenant. His blood shed for many, not all. Sufficient for all, but efficient for those who have put their trust in Christ. There's a difference. But then he goes on with some good news. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until. If there's an until, he's not staying dead. There's a resurrection. They knew he was going to die. Now he's reminding them, I, I, will, I will live. There is going to be a resurrection and then a return. He promised that he's going to return to be in charge of a millennial kingdom that he's going to rule from Jerusalem, and we've talked about that. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, I also want to touch bases, tie it in with it. In the book of the Revelation, chapter 5, same message repeated. Worthy are you, talking about Christ, to take the book, break the seals. Tribulation time coming. You were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Sound familiar? Through your blood, you purchase. He doesn't say everybody. In Matthew, he says for many. Here he qualifies it saying there will be men and women from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. I was thinking, sitting back in the chair between services thinking it's interesting to me. The focus was not my particular ethnicity, 
your particular ethnicity or heritage. It was, there are going to be people coming from every tribe, every nation, but I'm coming back for what? The ones who said yes to me and my sacrifice covered their sin. It just reminds me when I think one race human, and that's who I died for. He died for human beings. He goes on. John writes, and I want to pick this up in nine. You were slain. I wrote a note to myself, said, Carl, that's a past tense. He was slain. The purchase has been made. Verse 10, you have made them, meaning those who respond to him, a kingdom of priests. That's present tense. So you were slain to purchase those who put their trust in you. Those who put their trust in you now have a job to represent you as priests in a dying world. Just like the Old Testament priest represented God to the people, our job now here and in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9 says, we're to function as priests representing God to a people that are dying. And most of them don't even know it. We will be priests to our God and then future. And they... That's the ones who have been believed on Christ and function as priests. They will reign on the earth. We've been promised that the work we do for him now is going to be part and parcel letting us know what we will be doing in service with Christ during that millennial kingdom. So past, he paid the penalty. Present, we're functioning as priests. Future, we will be reigning with him. That's coming. That is going to happen. So when we think about taking the cup, yes, we remember not only the death, we also remember the resurrection, and we also remember the reigning, the ruling and reigning that's coming. So let's, uh, the, the, the cup, I'll tell you what, we need a training on how to do these because they end up spilled on the floor. But if you'll take the bread or the little tablet, when he, uh, when he introduced that, Jesus said, this represents my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's partake together. The juice, he says in the following verse, his blood represents the new covenant in his body, shed for many for buying back, paying the penalty. He said, all of you, drink it. Drink now. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, an indescribable gift. He who became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteous of God through him. You seem to get the wrong end of that trade, Lord Jesus, but we sure thank you. I pray that we would serve you faithfully as priests of the one true God with the breath you give us. And we anticipate one day being with you in your millennial kingdom, ruling and reigning with you. We praise you through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Happy New Year, everyone. So exciting. New year? Yes. 2021. It's just good to see everyone's faces or most of your face. That day is coming, but I just enjoy uh, being here with you guys and bringing the word and just so very thankful that each and every one of you are here and also on live stream. Welcome. Thank you for uh, joining in and uh, prioritizing uh, worship in the new year. Over the next uh, three weeks, I'll be sharing my vision for the church. So the direction, uh, the way that we are headed. So it's a very uh, exciting time. And I know it's only been six months uh, since I've been here, but uh, I want to get going. And uh, we have got going. We, we've done, man, the Lord has done an amazing work just in the past six months. 
uh, talking with our staff on all the Lord has already accomplished uh, since we've been working together as a team. And that's one real blessing at Antioch is having uh, unity in our staff. We have uh, myself and 10 staff members, and then we also have an elder board that is comprised of uh, our three pastors and four lay elders. And there's unity within the elders as well. And so when there's unity, God does amazing things. Um, so just so excited to share my vision for the church over the next three weeks. Uh, today I will talk about the mission of the church. Uh, next week, the unity of the church. And the final week, the prosperity of the church. So today, with the mission of the church, we'll be in Luke chapter 19. So if you have a Bible, uh, please turn to Luke chapter 19. We'll take a look at verses 1 through 10, which is the story of Zacchaeus. And you will also see the verses on the screen if you're here or watching on live stream. When Zacchaeus met Jesus... Everything changed. You may know Zacchaeus from the children's song. That Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Zacchaeus is well known for his height, or lack thereof. But we will see in this passage that Zacchaeus also had great faith. So we will look at Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It starts with he, speaking of Jesus. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. And in verse 10, we see the mission of Jesus. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The mission of Jesus is clear in verse 10. It's to seek and to save the lost. And we will have the same mission at Antioch Bible Church. We will exist to seek and to save the lost. And when I share this message about the mission of the church, I don't want you to just think about a building or how many people are in our congregation, but I want you to think about yourself. Because each and every one of you play a critical role in the mission of the church. You are the church. It starts with each and every one of you. So as we learn about this story and learn about the mission of Christ, Think about how does this apply to me? How am I going to seek and save the lost? How is God calling me to join the mission of his son, Jesus Christ? So in this story in verse 1, 
we see that Jesus was passing through Jericho. And Jericho was located by the Jordan River. It had great access to water. So it was a wealthy city. It was a border city. And when goods were being passed from east to west, it was a very popular place to be taxed on those goods. And Jesus, he was just passing through Jericho. He was heading west to Jerusalem where he would give his life for you and I and die on the cross for the remission of our sins. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. So think he was like a corrupt CFO. He was the biggest crook in town. And Zacchaeus was in charge of all the other crooks that sat at the tax booth. And so what these tax collectors would do is they would charge unnecessary taxes and fees to pad their own bank account. This is how they got wealthy. And this is why in verse 2, it states that Zacchaeus was rich. You may recall the tax collector in Luke chapter 18, just one page to the left. That tax collector beat his chest by saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The tax collector didn't even want to raise his eyes up to heaven and pray to God. And this was his disposition for his sin. And Zacchaeus, he's well known for being short. Uh, due to ancient Mediterranean standards, some scholars believe that he was less than five feet tall. So the crowd is there and he cannot see over the people who are taller than him. So what he did is he ran up and climbed a sycamore tree. And sycamores are sturdy trees and have branches that make them ideal to climb. And almost all of us have climbed a tree at some point in our lives. Some children here, you're like, yeah, I've climbed a tree before. I mean, I'm not the best climber, but I think I've climbed up a tree. But many of us don't climb trees as adults. But Zacchaeus climbed a tree as an adult. It's like he exercised a childlike faith to see Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to meet Jesus. And then Jesus stuns the crowd in verse 5. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. Can you imagine this religious crowd? Out of all the people in Jericho, Jesus, you want to stay at his house? Are you kidding me? This is the biggest crook in town. But Jesus insisted that he associate with this sinner. And the life of Zacchaeus, it was flipped upside down when he met Jesus. He, he voluntarily cut his net worth in half. Think about your bank account right now. Think about how much money you have, your investments, your retirement account. And think about cutting that by 50% and redistributing it to the poor. How does that sound? You guys aren't excited about that? <laughs> this is what I wouldn't be excited about that either. But this is exactly what Zacchaeus did. And if someone is willing to make a change with their possessions, it's a sign that they've had a change of heart. This is authentic repentance. And also in Luke chapter 18, one page to the left, you may recall the rich young ruler. Very similar situation. 
And the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, keep all the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, I have done that from my youth. Jesus said, there's one thing that you still lack. Sell all of your goods and distribute it to the poor. And the rich young ruler put his head down because he was very sad. He was so wealthy, that's one thing that he was not willing to give up to follow Jesus Christ. So Zacchaeus did give up his wealth, and he was also willing to make restitution to anyone he defrauded at the tax booth. He's like, Zacchaeus, like, you can bring your receipts back. I know I probably fibbed on some of those receipts on some of your taxes. And Zacchaeus said, I'll restore it fourfold. This was an Old Testament custom. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, it says that if a man steals one sheep, he shall restore four sheep. When the prophet Nathan rebuked David for his sin with Bathsheba, he was telling of this story of this man who did a sin and David's anger aroused. And he said, well, that man who stole the sheep, he needs to repay fourfold. This was an Old Testament custom. Little did David know that the prophet Nathan was talking about him. Authentic repentance means that we're willing to make things right with those people we have wronged. That's part of the repentance process. And this is something that Zacchaeus was willing to do. So this authentic repentance led to salvation. We see in verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. A son of Abraham means a son of faith. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he rose on the third day, then you also are a son of Abraham. Verse 10 summarizes the mission of Jesus. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Do you notice in verse 5 the urgency and conviction of Jesus? Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Some people say, well, Jesus is never in a hurry. Well, he told Zacchaeus to hurry. He said, hurry, for I must. It's a necessity, Zacchaeus. I must stay at your house today. There's urgency and there's conviction with this mission. Jesus insisted that he associate with Zacchaeus because his mission was to seek and to save the lost. Let me ask you a question. Do you insist that you associate with sinners? Is there a purpose that you have? Is there a reason why you associate with sinners? Is it to seek and to save the lost? This is what Jesus had in mind for his mission. And the Lord God himself declared that he would search out and be a faithful shepherd for the sheep. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 16, God himself declared, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them justice. 
This was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born. And in John chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as the promised good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. We all need to be intentional if we want to associate with sinners, with non-Christians. Now remember, when I say that word sinner, it's not a derogatory word. We were all once sinners. Someone had to associate with us. Do you remember the person who associated with you? Who shared Jesus with you? Who loved on you? This is what we must do for other peoples because we have been given this great grace. And so we must associate with others. And so we have to be intentional. Even in the pandemic, we don't go as many places and so it's difficult. The children and the teenagers aren't going to school. We're not going to the gym. We're not gathering much in houses or with people. But there are still places that we do go. I go and get my hair cut once a month. Well, hey, that's an opportunity. You don't have to know Jesus to go to the barbershop. I can share the love of Christ there. Where do you go? Is it the grocery store? Do you walk around your neighborhood to wave to your neighbors? You can have a socially distant conversation. We must associate with sinners at all times. You know, the the, the mask doesn't need to stop the mission of Jesus Christ. Prior to the pandemic, one place where I would go to associate with sinners is the gym. I've always liked sports. I've always liked working out. And so going to a gym, for me, it's a place to work on my fitness and witness. I can do both at the same time. And so one of my friends at the gym in Durham, North Carolina, he was about 70-year-old man named Big Bob. And every time I walked in the gym, Big Bob was, you know, doing his hand bike. And he would stop his hand bike and he would say, what's up, Reverend? And I would love that greeting from Big Bob. He'd just stop what he's doing and and say hello to me. And um, I would invite Big Bob to church many a times. And but Big Bob never came to church. And his friends, uh, who were senior citizens at the gym, would always joke around and laugh. And they said, Herb, if Big Bob came to your church, fire from heaven would come and burn down the sanctuary. So that was probably a good nudge, like, Herb, you should continue to associate with Big Bob. And so since Big Bob wouldn't come to church, I was like, well... Let me just share the word with him right in front of this hand bike. I said, Big Bob, have you heard about a man named Zacchaeus? He's like, I'm not sure. And I said, well, let me tell you about this man named Zacchaeus. And so I told him the story. And I said, Big Bob, what did you get out of that story? And he said, anyone can change. I thought Big Bob was right on the money. I love sharing the word with non-believers or nominal Christians who don't go to church because the way they say things is like, man, I'm going to use that. Anyone can change. But it's so true. And remember what we've been learning is that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And so Big Bob said, well, 
Reverend, I, I, I want to come to church with you. And it had been years. I mean, we're probably going on a good five years of building a relationship, talking with him. And I told him that I'm going back home to Washington. And he said, well, I'm going to come to church with you. His friend's like, no, you're not. Big Bob's never going to church. Lo and behold, one day, Big Bob dressed up, got a three-piece on, and Big Bob came to church. And he said it was the first time that he had been to church in 10 years. And he said he had a wonderful time. So the mission of Jesus begins with Christians associating with sinners for the gospel. My vision that I have mentioned before, and now I'm just going to expand on it, is to flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus. When I say that, a lot of people are excited. They're like, wow, that sounds good. Tell me more about it. But it's really a God-sized task. It's not something that one person can accomplish or that one church can accomplish. So if you're looking for me, a 37-year-old young preacher, to be some type of savior, you're looking in the wrong place. To flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus, this is a God-sized task. And we really need to hold on to this verse in Luke chapter 18, verse 27. It's also found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. And we also saw it in the birth narrative of Jesus Christ. This is the NIV. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so this is the foundation of my vision. Because when I share this, you may see, you may think, well, that sounds too big. That sounds impossible. We've never done it like this before. I don't know if I believe that that is possible. Well, you have to go back to the verse, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I'm excited for God to show up in the Pacific Northwest. I'm excited to see what God can do. Not through me, but through you. I'm excited to see what God can do, not through Antioch Bible Church, but through many churches in the Pacific Northwest. The population of the Pacific Northwest is more than 15 million, and it's growing rapidly. America is a continent of spiritual apathy. That's not to say that there's not strong Christians in America. There's strong Christians right here. That's not to say that there's not strong churches in America or strong pastors. Certainly there are. But America is not defined as a place that is thriving for Jesus. The global center of Christianity has moved to Africa and to Asia, and that's where the persecution is taking place for Christians. There is no persecution in America. It doesn't exist. Our lives are not on the line by gathering, reading the word, praying. But over there, their lives are on the line. But that's where Christianity is thriving in those persecuted areas. So the God-sized task to flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus is not the job of one church. We must work together with other churches in the area to accomplish this task. I think it's very important for pastors 
on the east side to work with other pastors on the east side and have a common goal to reach people with the gospel. And I think that that needs to be replicated throughout the Pacific Northwest. My vision is to launch an annual collaborative conference that many churches are involved with in the Pacific Northwest called the FLIP Conference. And this will be an exciting weekend that will draw Christians and sinners throughout our region. And we will invite churches regardless of size, how many people they have, ethnicity, or denomination. The focus will be the gospel message of Jesus Christ and to seek and to save the lost. At the FLIP conference, we'll have a gospel-centered speaker, a worship band, and opportunities to serve the community. So the most unchurched region, the Pacific Northwest, of a spiritually apathetic continent will unite together to flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus. On a side note, we will have awesome flip t-shirts. Just want to throw that out there. I'm all about the t-shirts. As long as I don't design the t-shirt, we will have flip t-shirts for everyone. And uh, here we'll have flip east side. Tacoma, flip Tacoma. Boise, flip Boise. Portland, flip Portland. And so the vision for Antioch is to become a multi-site church in the Pacific Northwest. So many of you remember Mars Hill. I believe Mark Driscoll was a pastor at this church before he started Mars Hill. And you remember Mars Hill? Churches were just popping up everywhere. I mean, they were really uh, doing something for the Lord. You know, when you have big vision, a lot of opposition is right there. I remember talking with one of my mentors and he said, Herb, think of any church in the Pacific Northwest that has ever tried to do anything great from the, for the Lord. Think of any church. All of those churches have all faced opposition. The adversary is working in the Pacific Northwest. And with this vision for Antioch to be a multi-site church in the Pacific Northwest, we must know that opposition and adversaries will come with the territory. Which is another reason why we have to be strong in the word, strong in prayer, and trust in God. So I want to launch several Antioch campus sites across Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. You see the map right there, and those are major cities in the Pacific Northwest. And the Lord will lead us where he wants us to go. But we could have an Antioch Tacoma and an Antioch Portland, Antioch Eugene, Antioch Boise, and so on and so forth. To give you an example of what this looks like, let's say one of Tacoma's finest, Pastor Alvalet III, becomes the campus pastor at Antioch, Tacoma. What would that look like? Well, Pastor Al would replicate Antioch's Bible-based cross-cultural model of ministry in Tacoma. Antioch Tacoma would gather for worship services in their own location. They would build their own staff and ministries. Each campus would aim to have a children's ministry and a youth ministry, college ministry and adult ministries. And Pastor Al would network with other pastors in the Tacoma area to reach the 253 for Jesus. And so here at Antioch Eastside and at Antioch Tacoma, 
We would work with other pastors in the area, other churches in the area. You guys would be fellowshipping with other believers at other churches, getting everyone excited for the flip conference that would happen on an annual basis on the same day. So if we have all these sites throughout the Pacific Northwest, let's say it's October 1st. On, on that weekend, there's a flip conference and every site in the Pacific Northwest will participate. And thousands will unite on the same weekend throughout the region to flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus. So through God's hand of favor, we will flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus. Also, one other thing that's really important that's a part of my vision is, you guys know we live in a digital age. All of our young people here, the phones, it's just part of them. You know, the, the millennials, online, social media. If we don't have a strong online platform, we simply will not be relevant. So we will utilize technology, online and social media technology, to flip the Pacific Northwest for Jesus. And we have already taken small steps to reach more people. We have added Sunday morning live stream. We didn't have live stream six months ago. We've added that. And do you know that our church attendance has increased since the pandemic has happened? I didn't really even notice that, but one of our pastors pointed that out. And our pastor said, I'm so excited that our church attendance is increasing for the first time in a while. And a lot of that is due to the live stream platform. And we are constantly trying to improve our live stream platform on a weekly basis. You know, what is the background that people will see? What about the transitions? Can we load videos and slides in there so the camera just won't boom over to the screen? We're always trying to improve our live stream. And we have also planned and implemented new social media strategies. We want to be relevant to young people. I'm so thankful for the adults, the mature adults, and the seniors that we have in the church. By no means am I saying, hey, we're going to be some young church and all you guys can go somewhere else. I'm not saying that at all. I'm so thankful for your knowledge. I'm so thankful for your giving. I'm so thankful for your wisdom. And a church needs that. But we certainly need to reach the younger generation as well. So we have our Facebook and our Instagram account. We've planned and implemented these new strategies to reach more people for Jesus. And please follow us on Instagram and, and Facebook. I think great things are happening there as well. So I would like to conclude this message with a recent basketball documentary that came out during the pandemic. The basketball documentary was called The Last Dance. And it was a series that chronicled the career of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. When Jordan was drafted in 1984, the Bulls were not a respectable franchise. And that was one of Jordan's goals. When he was a young rookie, he said, I just want the Bulls to be respectable. And as many of you know, Jordan became the greatest basketball player of all time, and he led the Bulls to six NBA championships. They three-peated two times. And I love one thing that Michael Jordan said in the documentary. He said this, it started with hope. All you need is one little match to start the whole fire. For us as a church, this all comes down to belief. And the critical question, do you believe that this is possible with God? 
Do you have the faith to believe that nothing is impossible with God? You could say that, well, no one's ever, this is a, a different thing. But God used 12 disciples to turn the world upside down for Jesus. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. If he used 12 disciples, couldn't he use our church to be that small little match to set the Pacific Northwest on fire for Jesus? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, Father, we are so thankful, Lord, to come before you. And Lord, Father, we come with humble hearts, Lord, with this vision to flip the Pacific Northwest for you. Lord, we don't have to wonder if you want the Pacific Northwest to know you. Lord, your mission is to seek and to save the lost. And Lord, that is the mission of our church. Father, we join you on your mission. Lord, do it. Lord, let us see the Pacific Northwest flipped upside down for Jesus. Lord, and it all starts with each and every one of us. Father, stir up our hearts to weep for lost people, to have a passion for lost people, to remember the people that invested in our lives. Lord, Father, create a unity among many churches in the Pacific Northwest to work together. Lord, it's not about any specific church. It's not about any specific pastor. It's all about the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to be just a little match that starts the whole fire in the Pacific Northwest. And if there's anyone here today who has not met Jesus, maybe you're in a position of a Zacchaeus and you want to see who Jesus is. Well, Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could have eternal life in heaven. He paid the price for your sins so you didn't have to pay the price yourself. Jesus took your place. And to inherit eternal life, what you must do is put your faith in the substitute, in the perfect lamb, Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus did it. He repented of his sins. His life was flipped upside down. Is that something that you need to do today? If you're here or if you're watching on live stream and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you that opportunity. You don't become a Christian because your family is Christian. You don't become a Christian because you go to church. You become a Christian when you repent of your sins and choose to follow Jesus. And this is a personal decision that every person must make. If you have never made that decision and you want to do it, Jesus welcomes you to do that today. Jesus welcomes you and says, hurry. Today is the day for salvation. If you have never put your faith in Jesus and that's something you want to do, just raise your hand right where you are. Is there any who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ? Is there any on live stream who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ? 
If that's you, just tell Jesus right where you are that you're a sinner. Tell Jesus that you put your faith in him today. Tell Jesus that you turn from your sins and you want to follow him for the rest of your life. If you pray that prayer with a heart of belief, there's no doubt that you're going to heaven. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to present your scripture. Lord, to present a bold vision in humility and to present the most important message in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to have a new year upon us. And next week, we will continue with the vision and we will talk about the unity of the church. God bless you guys and have a great week.